guys. Glad to be here. Um, I uh, have always enjoyed photographing animals, and when you have uh, captive animals, it makes it a lot easier. You don't have to find them first. Um, and so it's always been a bit of a love of mine. Uh, I've always enjoyed it. Um, and over the years, I've tried a variety of different things, and um, some things worked, some things didn't work. And because of that, uh, I get some credit for some pictures I put online. And so I thought maybe I would talk to some people about what I do. Um, I'm going to kind of present it mostly towards people that aren't photographers. And let me tell you a little bit about why that is. Um, oh, first I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> We're going to talk about these four things. My background and my equipment. My background was what I was about to tell you right there, but we're going to jump back on that. Um, and then I'll talk about equipment options, then I'm going to talk about basic photography concepts, and then tips to working with reptiles. Um, so we'll just go through those four uh, areas as we walk through this tonight. The first one is my background and my equipment. I'm not a photographer. If I was teaching this class to photographers, I would be way over my head um, because photographers have a certain way of thinking about taking pictures. They understand most, well, they understand everything I'm going to say to you tonight. Um, and so we would be talking about very different types of things. So I'm, I do have some good equipment and I do understand a small percentage of what it takes to take good pictures as a photographer, but I'm not a great photographer. Um, uh, I've just done trial and error, trial and error, and when you're taking pictures of the same type of thing, a snake, that's two or three feet away from you, um, you know, you get a lot of repetition of the same basic kind of picture over and over again, so you learn a few tricks that work. Now obviously, these are tricks that will work with geckos, um, various lizards, turtles, frogs. Um, some of those things would be much easier to photograph if they move slowly um, or if they don't move at all in the case of a lot of uh, lizards. Uh, a lot of times the lizards will just freeze. That makes it so much easier. Some snakes will freeze. Usually they'll only freeze for a certain period of time. Um, some snakes will never freeze. And we'll talk a little bit about how to deal with those snakes. Um, but for me, I just tried different things. Um, I, like all of us, started off with uh, a cheap camera. Um, actually, started off with a cheap camera before phones had cameras, <laughs> before cell phones existed. Um, and uh, then once, I, I, once cell phones had good cameras, which is reasonably recent, um, I used my cell phone for a while. In fact. I still use my cell phone for a lot of pictures, and I'm going to show you some that I've taken with my cell phone just for this talk. Um, I tend to not use it much anymore, although occasionally I'll be um, out in my room, my reptile room, it'll be a great picture, um, and I'll, I'll want to take a picture, and my, you know, my camera will be up in the house, or it'll be, you know, I won't have any, it, battery will be dead or something and I end up using just my phone to take the picture and I can get some pretty decent pictures with that um, but there's a few things you need to know to get a good picture even even with your cell phone so we'll talk about that in a little bit um, I am constantly trying to improve and I think that's something you can you can think about if you take 20 pictures of, of your animal and then you take a close look at them and you go none of these are good first thing you want to think about is, why are none of these good? <laughs> what went wrong? Figure that out. Whatever your solution is, try that, and then say, oh, okay, that did fix that problem, but now I see another problem. And I'm going to be talking about the kinds of things you're going to want to be looking for as you look at those pictures and evaluate how to make them better. Um, the, one of the things that I've noticed as I've gotten better equipment, um, because I've one of the ways I, I make money for my photography equipment is I breed snakes. And so um, it's a natural outcome to, as I make a little bit more money, to use it to get better equipment and more things to photograph my snakes. Which, by the way, I do not do it to sell my snakes. 
I do take pictures and sell my snakes, but as soon as I start taking pictures to sell my snakes, you know what? That makes it not fun. Becomes work. Yeah, I don't want to do that. It's way too much work. I look at my snake and I'm like, man, these are pretty. I want to get pictures of these to show people. And I'll use those pictures to sell them. Um, and so the one thing I've noticed is I've gotten better at it, better equipment, is it used to be I'd take 100 pictures and four of them would be really nice. Now if I take 100 pictures, about 85 of them are really nice. Um, that's the difference. I mean, some of my best pictures I've ever taken uh, was, you know, one in a hundred that I took one day um, with worse equipment, but they just, everything was right. You know, the lighting was right, the animal was in a great position. Some of those great pictures turned out to be great, but I wasn't very consistent. Now I'm much more consistent and I end up, you know, I, I used to throw away 99% of my pictures because they weren't any good. Now I throw 99% of my pictures away because I've already got a good one. And the others are fine, but I don't need to go through and look at all of them and see if they're also as good. Um, so consistency is the one thing I've noticed that has happened to me is I've gotten better and better. And by the way, that can, be, that can make it a lot faster if you're taking pictures of a large grouping of snakes. So, for example, some of you, uh, how many, how many uh, bearded dragons did you sell at Roseville? Like a thousand or something? Yeah. <laughs> Um, if, you, if you've got 90 animals to sell or you want to get pictures of, it's not easy to set one down and spend 20 minutes taking pictures of that one and then 20 minutes taking pictures of the next one. You want to get efficient at it. You want to know that I only took three pictures of that one. I'm sure one of those will look great and probably all three will. Um, so it's really helpful to be consistent. Um, I want to share with you my current setup and I've Got a picture of it here, and I'll show you uh, what basically is there. I, for most all of my pictures, I use a cleanable white background. And by the way, if you are selling an animal and you put a piece of paper on your clean white thing and then write on it with a Sharpie, you've ruined your clean white thing. <laughs> Good news, you got a backside. Um, but for those of you that have ever taken pictures of animals, um, sometimes they poop, sometimes they put, you know, anything on, on your surface. Um, I always have a paper towel and a spray to clean. Um, also, if you're taking pictures of multiple animals, if you're not getting rid of the smell, it makes the next animal more likely to poop in that same spot. So use a cleaner that gets rid of that smell on this plastic. Also, because this is a plastic that um, goes all the way through, you can sand off the marks, because I could sand that back part off with a really fine sandpaper, because I'm just going through two more of the exact same white plastic. So the Who few... Like hold, the, hold the questions oh, to the oh, end. Yeah. No, actually, you don't need to hold the questions to the end, but I will tell you where to get these... Uh, uh, in just a few minutes. I'm, I'm going to give you some recommendations on a few things. I have Amazon links. It looks like when you start going through your thing, you'll, it'll look like I'm a representative of various companies selling things. I just know how helpful it is for someone to say, this is where you can get it and this is how much it really costs. So I don't get any Amazon points for it or anything. I just am trying to be helpful. So you'll see that in a minute. So my setup is this. Occasionally I will use uh, uh, this grass and I'll put it in the same spot in my room. You can see it's actually on top of a hatchling rack in my picture. And then I have a backdrop that is the same material up against the wall. And that way if I take a picture where I'm getting down and it shows the back, it's cleaner. It's not some wood behind there or something else. Um, I always almost always use a hide when taking pictures of snakes. Um, and then if you see, I've got a camera with a flash on it. And then I've got these other flashes that are on either side of it, these smaller flashes, 
so that they can kind of fill the, the sides and cut down on uh, the shadows. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we're talking about tricks to using the lighting. But um, a lot of people think I have a big studio set up. Uh, I've tried different things. I bought these, aren't these nice? Uh, I've got two of these bad boys and they go on a tripod and you put your flash in there and they bounce the flash off of this silver background and back out on this. This is a big diffuser. Um, this is a great way to do it, but if you've ever been in my reptile room, this, there, there's no room to move if you've got two of these set up in it. Um, and so I bought these because I'm like, I'm going to take great pictures and I set them up and I took great pictures and I was like, they're really not any greater than the ones that I take doing this kind of thing. And it's so much easier. But this concept gives you the idea of what you want to do with your light. What you want to do with your light is get a lot of light, but you don't want it to be like a spotlight. You want it to be spread, uh, dispersed. And so... great for outside. What's that? Those are great for outside. Oh yeah, they'll fill in the shadows. Yeah, they'll fill in the shadows. Um, for photos outside as well. Any kind of diffuser would do that. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about equipment. Now this is an expensive option for equipment. This would give you comparable to what I use on a regular basis. Um, I could take all the pictures I take um, with this kind of setup. Uh, Sony A7 um, uh, camera which is basically this body uh, it all, I also have the lens. This is the same lens that I'm recommending. It's a macro, it's light, it's easy. And then a, this flash. And a few things about this equipment is um, I have a, a nicer lens um, that's way more expensive, but it's super heavy. And if I, because when I'm working with a snake, I'm holding this with one hand all the time. And it gets really heavy if you're holding it, moving it, setting it down, picking it up. And so one of the things I try to factor in is how much weight is going to be on here. And the truth is I start comparing this lens, which isn't a cheap lens, it's 550 bucks. Um, but comparing that to a higher quality lens, you really can't see much difference in this use. The other thing is a flash. If anybody, has anybody ever tried using flashes take, with your animals? Here's the greatest frustration I had. Um, I'm going to emphasize how important it is to use light. I take a picture with a flash, then I go take another picture. What happens? Well, the flash didn't go off that time because it was recharging. So then I wait, and I take another one, the flash goes off. Then I wait, and I take another one, the flash doesn't go off. By that time, the lizard's moved too. The lizard has gone on vacation, <laughs> and you are stuck holding a, a slow recharging flash. And after you've taken about 20 pictures, you got to change batteries. <laughs> so I have stumbled into this, again trial and error. This is a pretty expensive flash, I can give you that. But it's got a rechargeable battery and this thing will recharge in less than a second. So I'm taking pictures, picture, 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 picture. And when you've got an animal that's, you know, getting ready to go, you'd like to take five or six pictures in those few seconds that they're in the frame before they take off. Um, and if you have to constantly wait for a flash to recharge, it's a giant hassle. This one I can shoot a thousand pictures and this battery will last through all of them. So if you are someone who has a better camera and is interested in getting a flash, I'm going to tell you, don't get something that runs on double A's. Get something that has a rechargeable battery pack because they are way faster at recharging. Okay, so this is about $3,100. Most people don't want to spend $3,100 to take a picture of their lizard, right? Um, there are other options. If you're seriously into this and it's a business for you, maybe you want to get a decent, some decent equipment. Um, there's a, a level down from this. Uh, uh, Sony A6000 um, is not a full-frame camera, and it's like less, just under a grand. Um, and um, with that one you'd get a slightly different lens which would also be a little less expensive but you'd end up getting the same flash so you could probably do it for $1,500 um, so about half the price yeah does the other one also mirrorless yes 
but it's a compact um, reader, whatever we call those. See what a photographer I am. Um, <laughs> okay, so it, I'm going to assume that you this is not what you guys are doing um, because uh, there's a lot of things I would say about how to use this equipment if, if that's what you are interested in, but I think most people are interested in on the cheap. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah. No? Okay, we'll talk more about that later. Um, I'm going to talk a lot of, some of the things I talk about with techniques and things, just translate it into what, you're, what kind of equipment you're going to use um, and you'll be able to, to use it. Um, but I'm going to say smartphone, if you have a decent, somewhat recent smartphone, it's one of the best cameras that's ever existed in the history of the world. Um, so don't be too discouraged by that. Uh, smartphones are incredible cameras now. Um, but here's the key to using a smartphone, and I will say any camera. Light. Bright light. Clean and cool light. Does anybody know what I mean by cool light? Yeah. Looks cool, right? Um, you don't want it to be that yellow, that yellow light. You want it to be cool. So. In terms of uh, the marketplace, that's generally like a daylight kind of thing, right? They call it daylight. Um, and so uh, that's what I would recommend. And so I p specifically asked uh, to have this. This was on sale. Where, where were we selling this? At the, the at Lodi, Reptile. Lodi Reptile Show. We were selling this, this thing, this apparatus. And I was like, that's perfect for what I want to show in the class. And that is, all you need is something like this. For me, I just hang stuff above my table off of that wall. Um, but if you ha were doing this on a kitchen table, you could get your white mat, you could set it down, you could line this thing up and get this very bright light. Now you want to get it right in the center of your white mat, and then you can put your snake down. And if you can see, it does cause a shadow. You see that shadow? Um, it does cause shadow, but it's still a pretty clean light. Um, it's not a lot of like flashlight lights. You can see a circle and then some shadow rings. You don't want anything that does that. You want something that looks very clean like that um, so that the only thing you're going to have to deal with is the shadows of the, the animal you're taking a picture of. The other thing is if you get a two or three of these, you can move them sort of in different positions to cut down on your shadow. So it will be cutting out, cut, casting down in the shadow. Something like this you see in your thing is 25 bucks. It's super bright. It lasts a good time, period of time. And it has different levels. I would say if you're taking pictures, you would never want it to be anything other than the brightest it could ever be. And I took some pictures using this. Um, yesterday I think um, where I took my camera and I just held it like this I put the snake down and with my four hands I held it held this took the pictures to just show you you can get some pretty decent pictures with your camera um, and a simple light like this um, and then as I was preparing this talk I was like you know this works fine it's 25 bucks it's easy and then I stumbled into what you should really be using, <laughs> which is this, which is made for, actually it's made for video. Um, so you guys know if you've ever, uh, all you guys that are on TikTok, you know when you do your dance? You, you gotta have some light on you to show off your dance moves. Uh, those of you who have to do Zoom for your office meetings, you know, you put a little light so you don't look like you've died. Um, that's what this kind of light is like. And, this is a, what is a $40 light that um, I got off of, uh, off of, with a 15% off coupon. Um, literally ordered it yesterday when I was preparing this talk to come in today. I was hoping it would come before I had to leave for the meeting. Uh, because this is what I'd recommend if I was just going to have a light and a camera. And let me show you what this does. You turn this on. Again, this runs on a battery as well. And can you see 47 and 5500K? 5500K is how cool or warm the light is. 47% um, is how much light's coming out of it. So that's 
you can see it's not quite as bright as this but it does it will help to really kind of cover um, the light that you need and it will also allow you can you see the color change <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you can find the one here I'll turn it down so you can see what's going on a little better so you see how cool that is mm -hmm. and how and um, you could actually get something you could mount it on your phone um, they make little clamps that clamp on your phone and then it has a little flash holder you know those little flash slide on flash things and this comes with a thing that you could actually mount, mount on that so you wherever you're pointing the light would be going towards that animal so I think that might be a good option if if that's something you're looking at doing um, that's potentially it it's a very clean light it's not going to have a lot of streaks uh, maybe if you had this combo you know this one could light it this one could diminish the shadow, so you'd want to put it at a different angle. Um, you don't want to put them in the same place because they're both creating the same shadows. You might want to put this one on the side here, so it's casting out this way to eliminate shadows that are falling on this side. You guys know how shadows work? Okay, good. Um, but you do want to cut down on, on that. Um, so those are a few options. I do think it works to use a camera uh, on your phone, but I'm telling you, if you don't have good light, it's, it's, you're not going to get good pictures. Light. You don't think, I have people all the time say, what equipment do you use? Like, if I get that equipment, I'll take great pictures. <laughs> no, you won't. Because you've got to know what you're doing. It's not just point it at it, take the picture, and then all of a sudden you get perfect pictures. You guys will be able to do it after I finish talking about it tonight. But those guys, those clowns can't. Um, okay, so that's it. That's what I have to say about equipment. Any questions about equipment? Okay, basic photography concepts. The eyes have it. Anybody know what that means? Yeah, everybody wants to see your animal's eyes. Um, this is a super common mistake because we're like, oh, people want to see the pattern. They want to know this pattern. And it's like, nobody falls in love with your pattern. They fall in love with your face. And so always try to get pictures where it shows the animal's face and their eyes. Okay? Um, now, when I'm taking a picture of animals I have for sale, and they might have an incredible pattern and bright colors, I will always feature the picture where you're seeing their face and then in the, you know, in the series of pictures that are in an ad, I will put a picture like straight over the top so that you can see the pattern as well. And so there are certain things that, especially if you're dealing with certain animals, um, there, there are certain trademarks of certain animals that attract people. If you're looking to sell them, that's an important thing. And also, just if you're looking to enjoy, uh, enjoy it, figure out what things make the animal unique. And I have, I have so many animals I look at, I'm like, this one has the coolest eyes. This one has this, this great pattern on its neck. And so I try to emphasize, get a picture. So I, you know, it's, it's more, it's my way of telling you, look how cool the snake is in this aspect, in this area. Um, but you always want to show the eyes, the face. And you can see in those two pictures on this, um, both of those really show the animal's eyes. You're drawn in to that animal. Um, next idea. Rule of thirds and symmetry. Is anybody familiar with either of these concepts in photography? This is a very, this is like photography 100. It's so simple. But this is really significant. If you, if you don't know this, start paying attention to it. This is the way we tend to take pictures of anything. Point it at the thing and push the button, right? Um, what we want to start thinking about is how to compose the picture. And so the law of thirds is basically you divide the picture into thirds vertically and you divide the picture in thirds horizontally. And you want the eye to be drawn to something on the third. It might be on the third line. It might be on the corner of the third and the third. But you want the attention of the picture to generally be in one of those thirds. Um, also, if you take a picture of the ocean and the sand and the sky, a third, a third, a third. 
It's a much more interesting picture. Um, so just think about those kinds of the value of thirds. And here you see the focus of this picture I took is on the face of the animal sticking out its tongue at you. We see its eyes, and that head is really in the third quadrant. You see that right up there? There's uh, an exception to this, and that is when you want to take a picture and you want symmetry to be the thing that draws you in. And so you want stuff the same on the left and the right, or you want stuff up the same on the top and the bottom. And you'll see this, like this picture, I got this picture, and then I cropped it down so that it, and tilted it, so that the tongue was going straight up and straight down, and it splits the picture in half. Um, it's basically, you look at the picture and say, what makes this picture interesting? How do I emphasize that? How do I help people to see that? And in order to do that, you take a picture, and then you don't just go, okay, I'm done with my picture. You have to now process it in some way. One of those ways is possibly by tilting it or, or cropping it down to size. And um, that, I think, is something that we often neglect in uh, snake photography and animal photography. So here's a picture I took. Uh, Baron's racers are very hard to take a picture of when they're babies. Um, they, I'll show you the trick of putting them under these things and you pick it up and generally a snake will sit there with Baron's racer, it's halfway up and they're half off the table. Um, and so some snakes are really hard to get pictures of and so occasionally, especially if I can't, I don't have all day, um, you've probably noticed if you keep snakes in particular, when you open the tub, usually they're not moving. They're just sitting there like, what do you want? And that's a great place to take a picture. Unfortunately, it's not always the most beautiful spot to take a picture. Here's one, got some nice poop in the front of the picture. Um, it's kind of hard to see what it is. Um, and you see, simply by cropping in that picture, it, it looks like a picture of that snake. The one on the left looks like a picture of the poop. Um, at best, a picture of a tray. This is a picture of a snake. So you got to crop in. And this is really important because everyone looks at your pictures now on a screen that's this big. And so pay attention to how much space you have to work with. How many of you have seen these uh, things on social media where it's like, what kind of snake is this? And there's like their driveway, and then there's like a, a something that's a line in the middle of their driveway. What kind of snake is this? Like, that's a great picture. One that you're very afraid of uh, because you won't get close enough to take a picture of it. I've seen people who have snakes for sale, and they're like, well, you know, I'm, I, there's 89% there's bedding, and then this little line of something that's a snake. And it's like, that might be a nice snake. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. Crop your picture in so that people can see it, um, especially because they're going to be looking at it on a tiny screen. Light, light, more light. This is, if you leave with anything, it will be make sure you have enough light. Now, uh, what I want to show you is, in addition to the lights I showed you, the side left and right and the on-camera flash, I also have fluorescent light specifically above my area to light that. And I also have another one of these flashes mounted to the ceiling that will go off. So this flash is, will be a master flash and it will tell these other flashes to go off at the same time. So just to show you how committed I am to light, how significant it is. For example, light will give you detail. It'll allow you to see with greater detail. It'll allow your picture to be higher resolution so you can crop more without it looking like a blurry mess. It will also give you a deeper uh, depth of field. In other words, you won't get like the, the eyes are in focus, but the rest of the body out of focus. Now phones are actually pretty good because phones, because the lens is so tiny, um, they will give you a pretty long depth of field. But that means in order to get a decent picture, you need a lot of light or else it's going to be really low resolution. Yeah? The light on the ceiling that's the same as on your camera? Yep. Is 
Is that um, Wi-Fi controlled or Bluetooth? Uh, they are, I think they're connected by Bluetooth. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, camera equipment is designed to run, um, flashes run off of signals from other things. There's a variety of different ways to do it, but yeah, these are all connected. Um, and notice, by the way, that even with my flashes, all of my flashes have diffusers on them. Did you notice that these, this, this? Because otherwise, when they flash, it's just too stark, and it just makes a sharp line shadow, and it's very distracting. I don't think it allows you to focus on the animal. Kerwin, you have an, a question? You, you looked very confused, like, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. Um, contrast. Contrast can really change it, especially, I, I think one of the problems is, ooh, the lighting, the lighting on this projector is horrible, so don't judge my pictures by that. Um, so uh, you can adjust contrast on a particular picture, and I want to show you if, you, if you make it really light, it makes the, the, the animal look like, you know, super hypo. Uh, if you make it really dark, it makes your animal look really dirty. Now, if you want to just show off how awesome your animal is, you can make it look however you want. But if you want to sell it, you need to make it look like it looks. Don't make it, don't go, oh, look at all these changes I can make to this picture and make this look like a super cool animal and then somebody gets it and they're like, what? So make sure you are finding the correct contact, contrast. Lots of times I'll look at my picture and just because I've got so many snakes, I'll look at the picture, I'll look at the snake and go, yep, that's it. Sometimes I'm like, oh, this looks way better than you, and I have to, <laughs> I have to fix it. Um, so this is an example of how the same, the, not only the same snake, the same picture, can look like a really kind of a different type of snake. And even clearer if you're looking on my beautiful screen. Um, white balance. We talked about the white balance of your light, but um, you can correct your white balance after you take the picture, as long as it's not too far off. And what you see here is a palmetto corn that uh, on the left is too warm, so it looks, I think to our eyes, it looks red. It's really yellow. It's red-yellow. And too cool on the right, which is blue. You guys see that, right? And so what it really looks like is that. And so, if you get your picture, in all likelihood, when you take your picture and go to look at it, it's going to look like one of these. And then you're going to post it on Facebook, and somebody's going to say, oh, that's cool, I've never seen a blue palmetto before. Um, there are lots of people I see who post pictures, and they're like, oh my gosh, that's the reddest snake I've ever seen. And I want to write in the comments, those are the red, pinkest paper towels I've ever seen. <laughs> because... They have not white balanced it, and so people think the snake's a different color than it really is. And so this is how significant it is to do that sort of thing. You want to make sure, this is called tent, but it, it's a white balance, um, and generally it's expressed by warm or cool. And one of the things I noticed when I took pictures with this light, which I don't normally use, but when I was doing it yesterday, all my pictures that I was developing were blue when they started. And so, for example, if I was taking pictures with this, and all my pictures were on my phone were blue, what would I do? I'd just adjust this so that it would be closer when I took the picture to not have to do so much white balance. So, um, this, this light is evidently more daylight than it should be. Um, okay. Uh, now we're going to talk about some... Uh, editing, but I wanted to mention a couple of things. This is the same animal as you see on the, the graphic there and on your page. Um, the, pic the picture that I put on the front and at the bottom of every page is a velvet swamp snake, and I think that picture is incredible. I love that picture. Uh, it, you can see the eyes. It looks like it's doing something. The tongue's out. Um, that picture was taken by me <laughs> this snake would not settle down, and I'm like, okay, I, I surrender. I'm, some days it just won't work. 
And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to hold you down and take pictures. And so I was holding the snake in my hand and trying to get pictures of it while it kind of just... And that great picture, and this one you can see the hand, my hand holding it. Um, uh, you take the picture and then you just crop it down to show the part that looks good. Um, now, this girl was moving around a lot. Um, but eventually you get a few shots. I've got tons of pictures of, with her all the way wrapped around my hand backwards um, or, you know, looking horrible. Um, but it's just, if you have an animal that's hard to control, um, try taking a picture of part of the animal by maintaining the other part. Um, these girls will usually be pretty good for me but not that day, which I'm grateful for because it gave me this picture that I would have never gotten otherwise. Okay, simple digit digital editing. Um, now, I mentioned those, some of those things you do. Crop, you white balance. Um, those things are very significant. Um, you can adjust contrast, and you can do that on the simplest program that comes on a Mac. I'm, I don't know the PC equivalent, but on a Mac, there's a program called Preview, which is what you just look at your pictures in. It's very simplistic, very doesn't do anything special. And I use it a lot for kind of the final touches, especially white balance on my uh, pictures. So I'm going to show you the use of that particular program, Preview on Mac. Um, I'm, I'm sure there is a similar thing on um, other uh, uh, computer types. And then I'm going to show you a photo edit on an iPhone. I take the picture, then I take that iPhone, and I edit it on uh, my iPhone. So here's the first one. Um, this is actually, it looks like it's the back of this, but it's really just a computer screen with the same background. You with me? There's my cursor. There's my folder with pictures. So I'm going to open up the photo with the pictures. Here's a picture I want to edit, open with preview. Now preview will open this up. What color is the light? Blue. Blue, yeah. This picture was taken with my phone with that light. So now I'm going to go in and that little slider controller opens this up, this bar. Now I'm going to crop it by just selecting it. I can open this up, then I can move it around a little bit to get it just, just get rid of all that extra junk. Hit the crop button up top. Then I zoom in on it a little bit so I can see it a little better. Then I'll come over here, and this is the white area. You want to make the white area lighter. So I just bring this in, and then white balance by clicking on this dropper, which will adjust temperature and tint. See it change? And then I save it. And you can see this was, this was a way better picture now than it was before. Uh, it was that simple. That was with a phone and with this light. Um, so I think I'm showing you how great it is. So proud. Okay. So that's a, that, that's a simple way. I, when I do my pictures, I do a lot more than that. Um, I use one of the other 20 programs that was down below Preview. <laughs> but I almost always use Preview at the end because I do two things on it. I do my final white balance on Preview because for whatever reason, it's better than the expensive program's white balance. I don't know why. Um, it's also one of the reasons why I tend to use a white um, background because with a white background, it's easy to white balance because you have something that's white. Um, if you take a picture on something that's brown, it's really hard to tell when you've got your white balance. And here's a little trick. If you're using a flash and you get a white spot like on an eye, use the white spot for your white balance. Because that is white because it's so bright, it doesn't have any color in it. You with me? That will tend to find a good white balance. Um, so, here is the phone. This is, this is the screen of my phone. And this is a picture I took with my phone. 
and I'm going to go up and edit. Oops, I got to push another button. So I'm going to edit. Actually, you can't follow a mouse on this one because it's my script TV screen. So I'm going to hit edit. Go ahead and hit edit. There you go. Um, and then you see these controllers on the side. There's adjust, but the first thing I do is crop. So this is me touching the screen of my phone, bringing it in. See how blue the, the white is? White balance is way off with that uh, light. So now I go to adjust, and that will be adjusting colors. And there's all these different things you can adjust, but the most significant one here is tint. And see it says warmth. That's the warmth, so I'm getting rid of the blue. And then the tint is the, the other option. Well, that's not very good, is it? Oh, you know what? It is good. The projector's bad. <laughs> I was like, oh no, it's perfect on my screen. So this is really white, actually, in real life. Um, but the projector is white balance is off. Um, so trust me. But look what a nice picture that is if it had proper white balance, which it does. Um, <laughs> Okay, now a couple of uh, other things, uh, tips to working with reptiles, backgrounds. As I mentioned, white and easily cleaned. Uh, are you on the right page, Armando? Yeah, it's on the back. Yeah. <laughs> if you look on the correct page that we're on right now, you will see a information on what this thing is exactly. Uh, you get a two-pack, which is four sides. For $46. I mean, it's it's cheaper than, I mean, it's more expensive than, like, uh, what do you call that uh, stuff you buy, the, the board? Poster. poster board, thank you. It's more expensive than poster board, unless, of course, you're having to replace that poster board all the time, which you are, if you try something like that. So, I also have um, previously used just a white table, a white plastic table. Um, which obviously would also work. But I find this a pretty good material because it's not real shiny. Um, so it doesn't bounce a lot of light back at you. It kind of absorbs the light, spreads it out. Um, so I think that's a good option. One of the problems you run in with any particular color on your background is if you were to use a regular, cam a regular phone camera and not, or any camera and not make adjustments to it and take a picture of a white snake on this, Sometimes it's hard to get the details because it's white on white and it's hard to see. Worse, you might be surprised to learn, is if you try to take a picture of a black snake. Because your camera is going to say, okay, this is a normal colored scene, so I'm going to try to make the white as dark as possible and the black as light. No, no, it tries to, make, tries to make everything darker because it sees this big white area. And so the black just turns into solid black and you can't see the details. So lots of times, if you're not, if you can't get a picture because of too much contrast or not enough contrast, use a different material material underneath them. One of my favorites is this AstroTurf. We had some of this stuff put in our yard, and the guy said, "You want me to carry it to the dump for you?" I said, "Oh no." Um, so we've got some of this, um, and I have this in my shed, and if I'm Taking pictures, I tend to like to use this particular material. It not only gives it a different color, um, it gives it texture. And a lot of the snakes really pop with the texture. And I think the camera has an easier time focusing because it has more things to focus on. And so some of the pictures are really sharp. Let me show you. So these are pictures taken on the AstroTurf. Okay, now to take pictures, um, the, the couple of the tricks that I use. Um, hides and hands. Number one, I've got this group of hides. So I've got this for small, this for small but a little bigger, this for also small but a little different, this for other ones, this for some, this one also. Now, some of these are obviously designed to be hides. Um, others are lids to things that uh, I've 
cut a hole in with a pair of scissors. Not a fancy thing, not a nice, but look at that handle. Now you've got something. Um, this thing, remember, you're doing all of this with one hand because you're holding a camera with the other hand. Um, and so you've got to be able to do it with one hand. This, I can't really get off very easily. And if you want a steak to stand still and you pick a hide halfway up and then drop it on their head, they're not interested in standing still after, stand, stand still after that. So I made this nice fancy handle for it. Um, it functions, I can set it down, I can take the picture, I, um, and it works to, to work with the animal. So I actually also have a bigger one for bigger animals that I use as well. So a lot of different hides. What you want to do, you don't want your hide to be clear. You want them to be able to hide. Um, you want them to feel safe. Um, and so what I do is I'll set the hide down in the middle of my light area. I'll take the snake out. Why don't you hand me that little one? Yeah. Okay, so I take the animal out of the enclosure. I'll use this tiny one. Hey, yeah, it actually looks like this snake and this hide in the pictures. And you can see how he's sitting there. So I take the animal out. Generally, if it's a really young one, it'll start pooping on you immediately. You want to get a paper towel and kind of milk that out because otherwise you're going to be pooping on this all over. Then you have the hide facing you at a slight angle a third of the way over. You, you with me? You see that? And generally they will, they will rest with their head sticking out and I sometimes just... So I put them down and she's just going right into the hide. Um, some snakes don't want to go in hides and you gotta... I, I was working one in the other day and then I'll put my thumb over the hide if they're too jumpy but she's doing exactly that right now. And so if she starts to come out, I can just put my finger there, let her relax. Um, I sometimes will touch the tail to get them to drive in there. Now what I don't do is then, okay, she's in, boom. She's not settled, she needs to settle. So I let her settle down in there. And then once she's kind of had a chance to kind of see the area and relax, I do not jerk it off, because if you jerk it off, it scares them. I slowly lift it up. And there she is sitting there waiting for me to take a picture of her. Um, now she's kind of spread out, so I would take what she gave me first. I would take a couple pictures here, um, kind of go down, take pictures of their eyes, the face, you know, get the tail in the background, take a couple of angles, and then I'm like, okay, I'd like a better picture than this. So I'm going to kind of just nudge her a little bit. Oh, nudge her, nudge her. There, oh, look at that. Good. Now, if I was waiting for my flash to recharge, I'd have missed that. <laughs> now she's headed off and she's like, I'm not going to give you any more good pictures. Now, some snakes are pretty calm by nature. Um, and so I will just use my hand on them. I'll just put my hand on them. I will actually apply pressure to their body so they feel safe. So they feel like they're um, going to be okay. And then I slowly lift it up. And one of the things I've noticed is that snakes will let you do this for a while, and then some snakes are like, no more. And no matter what you do, they are running for the hills. Uh, part of the key is just being patient with them, taking your time. But for people who say, how do you get pictures of those snakes? Almost always the answer is hides. Um, I, some animals that are hard to deal with, I'll hold them for a while till they get a little less jumpy. Then I'll put them in the hide. Um, and it's crazy. Some snakes are just, you can't get a picture of them, they're going crazy. You hold them for five minutes and they're just like, whatever. And you put them in there and you lift it up and they will stay in a perfect pose for 30 minutes for you. Um, so I think that that's one of the keys is to be patient with that and let them feel comfortable, slowly remove it. And if it doesn't work, try it again. If it doesn't work, try it again. And if eventually you just want to bite the snake's head off, put them back, get a different one, go back to that one. Um, so that's how I tend to take pictures of these guys with the hides. Um, I just think working them and being able to take the picture with one hand is really significant. Um, 
Any questions about any of that? Yeah. On your uh, camera camera, are you using manual focus or autofocus? Almost always autofocus. Uh, um, yeah, almost always autofocus. On my camera, it has the ability to pick an eye of a subject. And if, in the case of the snake, it is a high contrast eye, like a light colored snake with a dark eye, it will nail that eye every time. But most of the time it doesn't because snakes don't have normal looking faces according to cameras. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, and that's, it, of the pictures I discard, it's almost always a focus issue. Um, because that's the, that's the one variable that's constantly changing. If I have the same lighting and the same background, that's all the same. But when I'm trying to get a focus picture, that's, that's the issue that is likely to be off. And, and, and with this kind of equipment, the picture's in focus, but it's maybe not the part you want in focus. So the tail's in focus and the head's all you know, out of focus, fuzzy. That's no good. So you want the head always in focus and sometimes the middle of the body and the head's blurry, no good. So, uh, another question? Do you ever uh, cool your snake slightly? Uh, especially the ones that are really active? I've thought about it. Um, I've never, I, I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, if you wanted to get a good picture of your s snake, um, letting them be cool, taking them off heat, cooling them down to 60 degrees or s something. Um, they will be a lot less active, probably. Um, I've never used that, but I have thought about it. I thought, what if you had like ice underneath the, the, your, your surface and you put them on here and it was just cold? And I thought, mm, I think they'd want to get off of it. <laughs> so they, they would shoot out. But I've thought about that. And quite frankly, some of the snakes do, they're off heat and they're like in the cold part of the tub. Um, that's a good time to take a picture because they are slower when they're like that. Yeah. I'm just curious for the uh, very active snakes that really need to get a shot. Have you ever tried taking a 4K high resolution video and then take pictures off your video? See how that works? Because you take the snapshot as long as you have a super high frame rate. Yeah, you know, I haven't tried that, but I do. Uh, I am able to take like 18 shots a second with this camera. So it's similar concept if, if I do that. But generally, you end up with a lot of bad pictures. Um, but occasionally you get one that's just right. That's, um, but I haven't tried that. I think that's that's certainly an option. Um, At least you're not wasting film. I am not wasting any film. That's, I mean, that's the key to knowing. That's the great thing about the digital age is you, you just take a bunch of pictures, and there there have been times where I'm like, oh, I took four pictures. Every one of them was perfect. That's good. And then I go and develop. I'm like, everyone's out of focus. And I got to do it again. So I, I tend to take way more than I need, and I won't even look at all of them. I just kind of skim through, and so I'll take 30 pictures of one pose, and I'll go through and like, oh, this is this is how I want that to be. And there's 15 that I haven't seen. It's like, and they're not going to be any much better, you know, than this. And so I don't mess with zooming in on the others. Um, the other thing is you want to do, they want to get your animal in its best light. And so I say that generally right after a shed is the best time to take a picture of a snake. Because that's when they're the brightest, they're cleanest, they look good. Don't take a picture of your snake when it's rubbed poop on its back. <laughs> Clean it up. Clean those guys up before you take the picture. That might also be a way to cool them down. Um, also, there are certain species, know your animals, some animals are really calm after they've eaten, or if they, or not, a, not immediately after they've eaten, none of them are, <laughs> but shortly after they've eaten where they're full and not roaming around eating. Others are very calm if they haven't eaten for a while, because they're just, they're just like, well, I'm, I'm not expending any energy because I don't have any food. Certain animals are way brighter at certain times of the year. Most um, of the 
Kings and milks, in my experience, are brighter in the spring than they are the other times of the year. Uh, Madagascar cat-eyed snakes, I think, are seasonably bright and dark. Um, and so whatever time of year, um, try to focus pictures on that time of year. And so what I do is when I'm going through cleaning the tubs or feeding, I may open a tub and go, man, you look good. I'm going to take a picture. Um, if they stand out to you, that's, they're standing out. So get a picture of them. Um, but don't take a picture of your snake three days before shed and say, it normally looks better than this. <laughs> um, so you've got big subjects and small subjects. Small subjects are way easier because they're right there. You can handle them. With big subjects, you've got to handle them with two hands. You've got to get them settled. Then you've got to get far enough away to get them in the screen. Um, so with big subjects, I would recommend you... Um, I, I still use the same method, um, but for me, it's, you need a large surface because if they move a little bit, on my setup, my setup is really no bigger than this. So a, a big snake doesn't have to move very much to be off of this. Um, and then obviously I can't take the picture. So I have to start all over. So I have a, a larger piece of grass that I put on the floor when I'm taking pictures of some of the bigger snakes. It just increases the odds that you're going to be able to get an angle that's not showing other things. Um, and I have a bigger tub than that one. I just didn't bring it. Um, Small snakes tend to be jumpy. Big snakes do their best if you've handled them quite a while. Uh, patience. Be patient with those little guys. They just don't know what you're, they don't understand what you're doing. They're trying to figure it out. Um, uh, there are times when it's like, I gotta go. I gotta get the pictures of the last three snakes and I gotta go. And so I'm, I'm in a hurry, and that doesn't work. Um, I'm rushing. Guess what? When you're rushing snakes, they get nervous. Um, and so take your time. And one of the things I do when I'm really having trouble is I'll put them under the tub, and then I'll do something else. Uh, put them under the hide and, and do something else. I'll leave them there for four, five, six, seven minutes. And if they'll stay under the hide for seven minutes, you can bet when I lift it up, they're not moving. Um, and so sometimes I just get so frustrated, I just take extra time. And I also have used hides where I, where they're not really hides, they're bowls. So, you know, you, there is no exit. <laughs> so they stay under there. I'll put it on, on there. I'll put a water jug on top of it. And so they'll just move around and eventually go, well, I can't get out of here until they'll relax. And then take it off and get a picture of them that way. And then practice, again, like I said when we started, if you're taking pictures and you look at them, you go, you know what, these are all too blurry, too far away, too whatever. Think, how can I fix that problem that I am consistently having? Fix that problem and then you'll discover the other one. And just kind of slowly work your way through figuring out what's the best way for me to set it up, what's the best way to handle my animals in my setting, my situation. A very popular thing for people to use nowadays are light boxes. Anybody familiar with light box? Light boxes are used to take pictures of products. Shampoo. If you want to take a picture of shampoo, light box. That's the way to go. Light box is basically a fabric box um, that has an open side. And you put the product in and you have lights all the way around. And the lights go off or are always on and the light goes through that cloth and disperses everywhere. And so there's like no shadows, it's, it's great. However, snakes poop all over that cloth and they constantly run for one of the corners and get down into it. And I used the light box for about three weeks and then I was like, yeah, no, this doesn't work. And obviously, it really will, because most light boxes, I had a pretty big light box, but it was still way too small to take any large, even like a full grown corn, you couldn't do it, it's too big. Um, but for the babies, it worked pretty well, but it was just a hassle because 
One of the things I do is, depending on how they're set up, I'm going to come way over here and take the picture because that's where their face is. Can't do that on a light box because it's blocked by the fabric. And so I tend to just use this flat, create a lot of light, take a picture, process it. And, um, and then probably the last thing I would say is you got to enjoy it. Have fun taking pictures. If you have an animal, you probably love it. You probably think it's great. You probably think it looks great. Take pictures of it so other people can see that it looks great. Make them interesting. Make it fun. Enjoy the time you're spending together. You know, let, let them teach them a TikTok dance. Whatever it takes for you to enjoy your time with your reptile, I'd recommend that's how you take your pictures because it's going to be more enjoyable and they're going to be what they're going to be. Any questions? Mondo? So I, I just want your thoughts on um, like uh, taking pictures outdoors. I'm not sure. I'm sure over the course of your reptile life, you have taken pictures outdoors. Like I've noticed for me, and I don't know if this is true, that's why I'm asking you, but like it's probably a better time like when the sun is not so warm and so bright, but at the same time you don't want it when it's not bright enough. Is there like why are, why is taking pictures outside great? Because it's natural. The natural light. light. Yeah, natural light. It's the lightest it will ever be. You ever go outside and walk into a bright room? It's still dark. It is bright outside. The sun is very bright. Problem with taking pictures outside? You have one light source. And it if you're put taking a picture in direct sunlight, you have really sh dark shadows. So Ideally, I would say take a picture outside and use um, some sort of a diffuser. So you're putting basically you're putting the snake in the shade of like a white cloth that dissipates the light. Then it will be bright, but it won't be so stark. The other option is to just take a picture in the shade, and that'll still be very bright, but you lose a little bit of the pop color with by doing it in the shade. But I've taken a lot of pictures outside and the real advantage, especially with your phone, by the way, is bright. But it's such a, it's such a lack of a controlled environment. So I never, I was gonna say almost never, but I think I'm gonna say never take pictures of baby snakes outside. But adults, I will um, occasionally take pictures outside. And also you can take them like in trees. I took some fun pictures in trees and stuff. And again, I was enjoying it, right? I was just having fun. On the basketball hoop, I thought it was going to be so cool. They were stupid. <laughs> like, oh, this is going to be cool. My snake's going to be in the net. And like, that yeah, looks dumb. Um, but try some things. No? Did you have a question? I did. Do you shoot the auto, or do you pick your own F-stop and aperture's? Uh, I personally pick my own F-stops. Um, I, I adjust my aperture to um, allow for a deeper depth of field, which is why I need so much light. Um, and so I, I also try to move the speed up if, I'm get, if I have tongues. If they, they're t flicking their tongue, you can't take a slow picture or it blurs out the tongue. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I have so much flash is I want to be able to have a, a long focal uh, depth of field a deep depth of field and a high speed of uh, shutter. I can tell you my specific settings later when I look at the phone or my camera. I, I was wondering if you had any tips about um, highlighting um, snakes iridescent. I noticed that you're really good at making them flash. Shiny. So flash. Flash, absolutely. It's all flash because you got that light just bouncing off of them. So it's, it's like taking a picture outside. I mean, outside's a great way to show your iridescence too. But if you're taking a picture with, you know, light from a room, mm, that's gonna be rough. It's not gonna show up very well with the camera. Well, that's all I got.